Where do orcs go when they die? Tolkien thought about this a lot, so let's take a look. Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we dive deep into Tolkien's Legendarium, as well as other great fantasy worlds like A Song of Ice and Fire and The Witcher. If you're new here, welcome. What happens to various peoples when they die is quite an important part of Tolkien's Legendarium, not just at a theoretical or spiritual level, but impacting on the plot itself. When Gandalf's body died, the fact that he was a Maia meant that his spirit lived on and he could return as Gandalf the White. When Glorfindel died heroically in the First Age, he went to the halls of Mandos and was then fast-tracked back into Middle-earth in the Second Age. But when, say, Boromir died, it was final. There was no way of him coming back. But what about orcs? Do they go to the halls of Mandos like elves do, or somewhere else, or nowhere? In truth, this is not an easy question to answer. Not because Tolkien didn't address the issue in any of his voluminous wider writings about the Legendarium, but precisely because he did, at length, and seemingly changed his mind quite a few times on the subject. Of course, the question of an orc afterlife is inextricably linked to the question of what exactly orcs are in the first place. But if you dig into Tolkien's writings, you can find at least four different origin stories for orcs, and depending on how you count them, maybe even more. In his earliest writings, like Lost Tales, you can find references to orcs being made directly by Morgoth, out of stone. For all that race were bred by Melko, that's Morgoth, in the subterranean heats and slime. Their hearts were of granite and their bodies deformed. And later we read, The hordes of orcs he made of stone, but their hearts of hatred. Over time, this gravitated towards the orcs being made as a mockery of the elves, which perhaps leads on to the second origin story we have, which is what Christopher Tolkien used in The Silmarillion. All those of the Quendi, that's the elves, who came into the hands of Melkor ere Atumno was broken, were put there in prison, and by slow arts of cruelty were corrupted and enslaved, and thus did Melkor breed the hideous race of the orcs in envy and mockery of the elves of whom they were afterwards the bitterest foes. So in this version of events, the orcs weren't created directly by Morgoth, but instead were captured, enslaved, and corrupted elves. The thinking here seems to have been that Tolkien felt it important that Morgoth couldn't create anything ex nihilo, from nothing. Only Eru, the one true god of his world, could do that. So Morgoth would have to base his creations on something already made. Elves. Interestingly, Tolkien did hedge his bets a bit here, saying that this was what was held true by the wise of Eresea, not necessarily what was true. A third concept came in an essay just a few years after the publication of The Lord of the Rings. In that, Tolkien proposed that orcs were in fact pre-existing animals, but without souls, not therefore elves, who he taught to speak and corrupted into a mockery of elves. The fourth and seemingly final conceptualization of the origin of orcs is found rather randomly in an unfinished essay about the Druidine, those woodland-dwelling humans who play a small but significant role in The Lord of the Rings. There we read that, Doubtless Morgoth, since he can make no living thing, bred orcs from various kinds of men. So, not made out of stone or corrupted elves or soulless creatures, but humans. This seems to build on the idea of the uruk Hai, orcs bred to be able to withstand sunlight. As far back as the Lord of the Rings, we had Treebeard pondering their origins in this way. Are they men he has ruined, or has he blended the races of orcs and men? That would be a black evil. So there you have the four main ideas that Tolkien had for the origin of orcs. If you look for them, you can find other more blended concepts that he considered. Perhaps some orcs were corrupted elves, then later you got some human DNA mixed in there too, that kind of thing. But the four main building blocks remain the same. They were either created directly by Morgoth, corrupted elves, soulless animals, or corrupted humans. So what does that mean for orcs after death? Well, if there is some element of elf in them, even corrupted elf, then perhaps this means that they should go to the halls of Mandos, as all elves do. Tolkien definitely entertained this idea at one stage, opining that 
It remains therefore terribly possible that there was an elvish strain in the orcs. These may then even have been mated with beasts, sterile, and later men. Their lifespan would be diminished, and dying, they would go to Mandos and be held in prison till the end. So, if the corrupted elves' theory is right, even in part, then that is what happens to orcs. They go to the halls of Mandos like normal elves, but instead of being made to wait for a time, resting and healing and sent back to Valinor, they are simply locked up until the end of time. It's not a perfect analogy, but the halls of Mandos are thus a sort of elf purgatory. Those who have been good and pure, like Glorfindel, don't spend long there at all, whereas those who are utterly corrupted, like orcs, do. But what if there isn't an elvish strain here at all? What if orcs were made by Morgoths from stone, or were just soulless animals he corrupted and taught to speak? Well, then we have to quickly touch on Tolkien's concept of the soul itself, or fea, as he called it. Without going too deep into this, and Tolkien does go quite deep on this, there is a difference between incarnate races, those which are designed to exist as a union of soul and body, and other types of races who are not. The incarnate races of elves, human, dwarves and the like die when their soul and body are parted, with the death of the body. So the question there is what happens to the soul? Some beings in Tolkien's Legendarium are, however, spiritual beings. Their soul does not need a body. An example here, of course, are the Maiar, Sauron, Gandalf and the rest, who can choose to take on a physical form, but do not have to. And some beings are purely physical in that they do not have a soul. Tolkien doesn't outright say it like this, but that covers most animals. As an aside, there are some notable exceptions here for various reasons, like the Great Eagles, Huan the Hound, and so on, but we're not talking about them here. When animals die, therefore, their bodies die, but there is no soul to have any kind of afterlife. So, to bring this back to orcs, if they are corrupted animals or made from stone, nothing happens when they die. They just die. If they are corrupted humans in some way, then we do have to worry about the soul. But even in Tolkien's world, no one knows for sure what happens to a human soul when they die. They seem to go to the halls of Mandos, and from there to somewhere else outside the world. So, as I said at the start of this video, there isn't a straightforward answer to where orcs go when they die. A lot depends on which of Tolkien's various conceptualizations you go with. If you go with the version in the Silmarillion, perhaps you think they are imprisoned in the halls of Mandos until the end of Middle-earth. Or if you think they are corrupted animals or made from stone, then perhaps you think that nothing happens, they just die. Or if you think they are corrupted men, then no one truly knows. But let's go back to Tolkien's actual words on this. Because in 1954, he wrote a letter to Peter Hastings, the manager of a Catholic bookshop in Oxford, in which he covers a lot of these issues in rather theological depth. And I think it gives us an insight into Tolkien's mind on the matter. In this section, he discusses the idea of Morgoth making rational creatures like elves or men, the obvious example here being orcs. They would be Morgoth's greatest sins, abuses of his highest privilege, and would be creatures begotten of sin and naturally bad. I nearly wrote irredeemably bad, but that would be going too far, because by accepting or tolerating their making, necessary to their actual existence, even orcs would become part of the world which is gods and ultimately good. But whether they could have souls or spirits seems a different question. And since, in my myth at any rate, I do not conceive of the making of souls or spirits things of an equal order, if not an equal power, to the Valar as a possible delegation, I have represented at least the orcs as pre-existing real beings on whom the Dark Lord has exerted the fullness of his power in remodelling and corrupting them, not making them. So, orcs do have souls, or at least Tolkien thinks that they might, and neither Sauron nor Morgoth had the power to make a soul, only Eru, God, could do that. So, as their souls came from God and they lived in God's world, that had to mean that orcs weren't irredeemably bad, just bad by nature. Tolkien goes on for a few sentences more in this letter about why God might allow this, before seemingly abandoning it. He wrote at the top, not sent, with a little note of explanation. 
It seems to be taking myself too importantly. There is a humility here, even with his own sub-creation. Tolkien stopped himself as he was starting to get into speculating on things like whether any creatures are beyond salvation, the nature of a soul, and ultimately how God might view that soul and its fate. Tolkien, as a strong Catholic, almost certainly felt that whereas he could speculate and theorise about such things, those were not decisions for him. That would be taking himself too importantly. They were questions for Eru, God. And ultimately, I suspect that that is why we never get a final answer from Tolkien on this. He tied himself in knots and changed his mind several times, trying to find a solution that he felt worked theologically. But deep down, he felt that questions of the eternal fate of any creature, even an orc, are not for him. Who is he to judge another soul and decide its fate? It may not be the clear answer we might crave from Tolkien about where orcs go when they die, but I think it tells us a lot about who he was and what he believed. If you'd like to see more videos diving deep into Tolkien's Legendarium, there's a playlist appearing now on the left of your screen. Or if you'd like to support this channel, thank you. There's a link to my Patreon on the right of your screen. Thanks for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.